Everyone who's already joined us, welcome to our second Women in Leadership Speaker Series of the school year. And we'll get started in just a few minutes. We're going to make sure that we give everybody some time to log on and find us. Um, while, while we're waiting, actually, um, because I want to make sure that everything that the panelists say is heard by our whole audience. Kelsey, why don't you just talk for a minute about the Junior Venture Project you're working on? Describe it in a few sentences. Oh, yeah, of course. So I've been working on a way to see how breathing technique and heart rate correspond. And so I've been thinking about breathing and how that's such an important part of our lives, of course. And many different techniques are used to help lower or raise your heart rate, whether that's in yoga or in mindfulness or any other setting. And so my plan is just to see how those different breathing techniques are effective in lowering someone's heart rate and the heart rate will be raised for exercise just so that way we have a safe method of raising it. But I'm hoping that whatever breathing technique is found most effective can be applied in all other settings. Like if you need to recover from an anxiety attack or if you just wanna unwind after a stressful day. Thanks, Kelsey. For those of you that have joined us while Kelsey was talking, we have not gotten started yet. I'm just using our time in preparation to hear a little bit from our student moderators, and then we'll make sure that everybody's present when we introduce our panelists. Uh, Sonia, also uh, doing an uh, independent project through the leadership endorsement. Can you talk about your project for a minute? Yeah, of course. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to automate the detection of pneumonia or the diagnosis of pneumonia through um, this machine learning algorithm that's basically the combination of several algorithms that are modeled after the brain, and they're called neural nets. And what I'm doing is I'm ensembling these neural nets and trying to get the highest accuracy in diagnosing pneumonia. So uh, in the end, the end product would be just an algorithm that would uh, automatically diagnose pneumonia. And hopefully this will aid in radiology and um, help aid radiologists in making their diagnosis decisions. Fascinating. These young women are doing such important work already. And Serenity, I know that you're not in an independent project yet. Hopefully someday you'll be one of our leadership endorsement candidates. Serenity's in fifth grade um, and she actually runs her own small business. So, Serenity, can you tell us a little bit about the business that you're running? Um, so while I'm at home, I make like some things. And at one day I was like, I should sell these at school. So I put them in packages and then I sell them to people at school. I also have um, a little business called Shiro Bows, and they're actually these bows that pay tribute to women in history, and you wear them, so they're really cool, yeah. Thanks, Serenity. As soon as I heard about some of Serenity's business ventures, I decided she was one of our perfect moderators for our, our Women in Leadership Entrepreneurship panel. All right, so we are at nine o'clock. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. And, and I'm referring both to those that are in our Google Meet this morning and to all of you joining us from the classroom or from home. Welcome to our second Women in Leadership Speaker Series panel this year. This, year, uh, this speaker series theme is uh, Women Entrepreneurs Founding the Future. And we reached out to talk to women who were involved in creating, forming, founding, innovating in business uh, contexts. And so we welcome our three panelists today. Um, just a way to say hi and speak a, a little bit about yourself. We're going to be getting into the details later on. Um, but Sienna Elise Peel, welcome. Can you just say hi? Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today. I feel like I'm with family. Thanks, Sienna. Michelle Gillen Dubraj, hi, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. And Shana Jordan, thank you for joining us this morning. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. Excited to be back with my Sacred Heart family for the morning. So, looking forward to speaking with you guys. Great. Well, we get started. Our students have come up with a series of questions that they'd like to ask our panelists. And our first question will be kicked off by our fifth grade moderator, Serenity Bellamy. Welcome, Serenity. Can you ask our panelists the first question of the day, please? Yes. Could you, may you please tell us briefly what your job title is and describe it in a few sentences? Thanks, Serenity. Let's start with Sienna. Well, I would say I'm the founder of Fonde. It's an African-inspired fashion boutique and I design online fashion boutique and I design the clothes, 
I do the marketing, the social media, sending out the emails, basically top to bottom. I have my little small business. And I've gotten a chance to be on that website. The, the products are amazingly beautiful. Thank you. Michelle, how about same question to you? Yeah, hi, Michelle Gillen Gibraj. Um, I'm the owner of Tildy's Toy Box, which is a gender neutral toy store in Philadelphia. Um, and just like Sienna, I do everything top to bottom, accounting, marketing, social media, hiring, um, you know, merchandising, ordering, all of the things. Wow. Now I have not been in your store yet, but I go to Philadelphia often and I will be sure to stop in the next time I'm in town for sure. Shane, a question to you. Um, hi guys. I'm Shana Jordan. I'm the COO, which stands for Chief Operating Officer and Founding Team Member of Lolly. We are a Bitcoin rewards company. So what we do is we give you free Bitcoin when you shop online at stores like Sephora or Macy's. So stores that you guys know and love and like to shop at when you're not in your uniforms. <laughs> oh, and then in terms of what I do every day, um, a variety of different hats, um, making sure the business is up and running. I handle our HR. I do our retailer relationships. So talking to the brands as well as oversee our customer care team. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, to get the ball rolling, we thought we'd start actually with a little bit of fun. So we, I like would you rather questions because they always make people pause and think about unusual things in unusual ways. Kelsey, Kick off our would you rather questions. I would Take love the first to. One. Okay, so this is more of just a little warm up starter question. It's not too much where you have to think. Um, just weather wise, when it isn't a nice sunny day, would you prefer going out in the rain or going out in the snow? Shana? Hmm, that's a tricky one. I think I'd ultimately say the snow, um, especially when it's like the first snowfall of the year. Um, I'm fortunate to, fortunate to live in New York right now. So Central Park is kind of my playground. So a great place to be when it does snow. Michelle? That's a tricky one. Um, I think I would say the rain. Um, I get a little grumpy when it's snowy for some reason. I live in the city too in Philadelphia and you know, I feel like it's nice for one minute and then two seconds later, it's gross. So the rain at least washes away and cleans everything. So I think I would say the rain. Sienna? Definitely snow. I just think looking at the snow outside your window is just so beautiful What a sight to see. And I've been living in Liberia for the past two years. So it's the first time I've been in here and like seen snow. So I'm a little bit nostalgic and it was taken away from me. So I appreciate it more right now. <laughs> We have to hear more about Liberia. That's coming in a different question, I'm sure. All right, Sonia, what's your would you rather question? This might take a little bit of thinking, <laughs> but would you rather live without the internet or live without AC and heating? Michelle, to you first. Okay, that one does take some thinking. Um, that's a really good question. I think um, if we were living in our modern day lives, I would have to say I would live without heating and air conditioning because I think it would be very hard to live these days without the internet. So. Sienna? Yeah, that was easy. No AC, no heat. I can't survive without the internet. <laughs> Shana? I'm going to follow along. I don't think I could live without the internet and the ability to connect with everyone and do things like this. Spoken like three business women. <laughs> they need those connections. They need that internet. Absolutely. Thank you. Serenity, what's your would you rather question? Okay. So one of my would you rather questions is, would you rather eat pizza for the rest of your life or ice cream for the rest of your life? Um... Sienna, you had a strong reaction to that. <laughs> I have a strong reaction to anything, but definitely pizza. If you think about so much ice cream, you're just going to get sick of it. Where pizza, you can like have different toppings. There's so many different types of pizza, flat, deep dish, thin crust, different pizza chains. You could go, there's a lot of options. Ice cream, not so many. Shana, what do you think? I'm going to go with pizza. Um, you can have it for breakfast. You can like spice it up, put some veggies on it. So... I think I'm gonna go with pizza. Good and question. <laughs> I was going to say ice cream, 
but I think these two kind of changed my mind that the different toppings and things. So I think it'd be hard to live without uh, the ice cream, but I think I would say pizza actually too. <laughs> Good influencers there, I guess. All right, I think we're gonna put the other would you rather questions on hold for right now. Let's get into our next um, question where we learn more about what these fantastic women have done. Um, Kelsey, I think you're up next uh, with our question number three. All right. Would you mind explaining how you ended up at your job and what education you needed to prepare? Let's start with Michelle on this one. Sure. Um, I came to my position very roundabout. Um, so when I was in college, I studied architecture um, and mainly because you know, I did, still did not know what I wanted to do. I really loved art, I really loved science. A lot of people said, try architecture. So after going through all of my options, I felt like that was the best option for me because it kind of blended a lot of the two things that I really loved. Um, <clears throat> so I studied that in college. After I graduated, um, I continued my work study job, which I had um, at Penn. I went to University of Pennsylvania. Um, which was in medical research, and I continued that and was started full time. So I worked there for a few years. However, I was not interested at all in continuing in that field. It just wasn't something that I was passionate about. Um, I will say for me personally, and I think it's true for everyone to really find something that you're really passionate about, if that's what you're gonna spend your life doing, because you spend a lot of time at work and it's not really fulfilling if it's not something that you love. Um, so while I was there, I did a lot of thinking and soul searching. What do I want to do with my life? And I realized what I really love to do is to cook. So um, it was specifically, I love to bake. So um, I decided to go to pastry school. Um, I was still in Philadelphia working full time. I went part time in New York to pastry school, traveled on the train back and forth for nine months. Um, didn't sleep a lot, baked a lot, ate a lot of baked goods graduated that. Um, after that, I left my well-paying job in medical research to work as a cook for uh, $9 an hour. Um, and I loved that job so much. I had so much fun. I loved being arm deep in cheesecake batter. And I had a blast at just coming up with new flavor combinations. And I really loved what I did. Um, and then I got pregnant. And that's something as women happens if you want to have children. And um, I wasn't able to continue working. I was actually uh, kicked out of my job because I was pregnant. Um, and then I had, you know, I, so after I had my first daughter, I stayed home with her for three years, um, partly because I didn't have a job to go back to. And I knew that that kind of lifestyle living as a cook was not something that I wanted when I had a family. Um, so there's also that balance of what works for me and what works for my life. Um, and that didn't work for me anymore, even though I loved it. So I stayed home with my daughter for three years. And during that time, you know, I never had envisioned myself being a stay at home mom, but that's where I ended up. Um, and it was hard for me, not gonna lie. That was a hard time because that's something that I had envisioned and staying home with a young child is challenging. Um, but I really like dove into it. I loved it. You know, I took advantage of that time with my daughter and I really cherish that. But it also led me on this path towards the toy store um, because daily I would really kind of find out, you know, what are all these things that we have that she's playing with every day? Are they worth it? Did someone gift us this item? And did I think it was a worthy gift? You know, like, is it adding value to her life? Does it, um, you know, we live in the city. Is it worth the space it's taking up in my house? Um, is it something that she's going to play with more than once or more than for, you know, that six month time period? Um, and what is this toy teaching her? Like, who is it teaching her to be and become? And, um, you know, I started to get really frustrated about, you know, why does a block have to be pink for a girl to play with it? What, like, why is that a thing? Or why, you know, be because I have a daughter, why is she only getting dolls? Like, why can't she have it? Like, why isn't someone giving her a truck? You know, why um, Why isn't she getting those Legos to play with? Or if she is, why are they pink? You know, that would just be, you know, it was frustrating. And not only just that, but why if she wears pants outside, does she not, does someone not say that she's pretty, but 
But if she wears a pink frilly dress, then she's called pretty. So all of these things started to really kind of weigh on me a lot. Um, and, you know, I would start to talk about why gender neutral toys are important. And people would look at me like I'm crazy. Like, why are you thinking about that? That's not important. Don't, don't stress about that. You start to sound like a kook. And um, I didn't really feel like I was you know, doing something that was weird or crazy. I thought I was just being thoughtful. And I really found that a lot of people didn't think like I was thinking, and I think that they should. So um, I decided to do something about it, fix the problem. And how could I, you know, I started to think, how can I make gender neutral toys a topic of discussion? And the best way I knew how was to open a toy store that really featured those items that I felt were important. Um, so that was my path to my current business and it was a very windy one and um the education that i had you know in college definitely did not directly play into what um, led me to my business but everything kind of led me on that path and i certainly take concepts from architecture and all of my life lessons along the way that build upon you know who i am today and the business that i have um, and I would say, you know, aside from learning in a classroom, there's a lot of hands-on learning, just, you know, overall attitude, willingness to learn, to figure it out, to problem solve. That's definitely um, important when you are starting a business venture. Um, you can learn a lot of things in school and they're all important and they're all useful, but really that hands-on learning, putting those things that you learned into practice is where, um, you know, the learning really takes off. Wow, so a very long story. what a great story and the path so windy. I'll bet you we hear some more windy path stories today. They tend to be the stories that our successful women tell. Um, so, uh, Sianna, do you remember the question? Yes, I do. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so I'd say what prepared me is um, I've always been interested in fashion, makeup, beauty, like ever since I was small, even in high school, I remember watching Jackie Ina early in the YouTube days, watching her makeup videos. But um, I actually, when I was applying for colleges, I only was looking at schools that offered hospitality majors because I wanted to own my own restaurant or club or bar. I just loved food. But I actually, my guidance counselor at the time made me go to Babson. The Babson rep came and was talking and they only had a business major. And I was like, I don't know why I'm here. I'm never gonna do that. I'm never gonna go there. And then I ended up going there and they're actually known for their entrepreneurship. And they're, I think number one for it, that's right outside of Boston. And basically Babson just, I probably was already an entrepreneur, but Babson just heightened all my senses for it. And I, after Babson, you hear about entrepreneurship all the time and many people do start their own businesses, but many people do go into corporate traditional jobs. And since I was like, you know, I'm young, I don't have a husband, I have no kids, I'm never gonna be able to move to Liberia and just off the whim start a life. So since I was like, I don't have attachments yet, this is the only time I'm gonna be able to do this. And um, my dad's Liberian and I had visited there as a child, but I never lived there and I never had, um, I forget what it's called, abroad, an abroad experience. So I was like, this will be my own abroad experience. I'm gonna help my family with their businesses, but also start my own. And that's how I started Fonde. So I have my clothes made there, like I was talking about before, designing it. And that is basically how I prepared. Um, it. I don't know if it was so windy, it sort of almost feels destined. Like I didn't think of it in my own mind, but now that I'm here, I'm like, yeah, that kind of makes sense how I got here. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that with us. And we'll hear more about your company in a little bit. Shana, question to you. Perfect. Um, so I went to Georgetown and studied international business and marketing um, and really kind of thought I was gonna go end up working for the Olympics. I played field hockey and lacrosse at Stewart and was really into sports and that was kind of my dream. Um, I slowly learned a lot about that industry and realized it probably wasn't right for me, at least right out of the gate. Uh, so I started my career at a company called Shop Style. Um, it was a fashion search engine. And it was funny because I was very familiar with a lot of the brands that are around Princeton. So J. Crew, things like that. And walk into fashion the first day in like a pink, colorful outfit. Everyone's wearing black. Um, so I quickly learned a lot about fashion in New York. Um, there I worked with a bunch of retailers, so like Ralph Lauren and Gucci and Kate Spade. Um, and it was a really fun experience. I was there 
second employee in New York at the time, working with a team in California and London, and really just got to learn all about the business because I was so early on in their office there. Um, I really enjoyed the time there, but was never really a fashionista per se. So um, I eventually left there to go work for food and wine and travel and leisure, which are two things I was really passionate about. But what I realized is that I really flourished in a smaller company where I could ask questions and poke holes and learn from the leaders versus a large corporation where there was a lot of hierarchy and process and things like that. So I wasn't super happy there, even though I did love the stuff I was working on. And serendipitously, while that was all happening, two gentlemen that I worked with when I was at ShopStyle were starting a company in the Bitcoin space. And so they asked me if I would want to join them. And I at first said no. Um, I didn't understand Bitcoin. It was really complicated. It was this volatile thing that I kept hearing about on the news. And I was like, this is not for me. Um, but I read a book that they sent me and I learned a little bit more about it and got to understand the value of it or the perceived value that we have for it. And so I started doing something called moonlighting, which means when you work during the day at your normal job, but then at night or on a, an off hours work on the startup. Um, so at that point, we weren't even live, um, and I enjoyed the company before we even went live as employee number one. So I was there the day we got to turn on the light switch for the website and all of that. Um, and yeah, just a lot of it came through networking and the relationships that I made through my career. Um, and I think that was as the biggest things for me, really the time management of how can I moonlight and do my job. And then even now in my role, I wear so many different hats is how do I manage my time and prioritize things as well as the networking piece of it. So relationships that I've built, you know, while I was at Stewart and Georgetown to lead me to kind of the network that I had today and to this opportunity. So similar to what Michelle was saying, as much as it is the classroom learning of the skills of time management and things like that, it's also just a lot of the people you meet along the way and your willingness to kind of stay in touch and learn from them. We can't hear you, Bonnie. Thank you. I muted myself and then forgot. I think that so many times we think that there's going to be a moment when we're qualified for something. And when we wait to be qualified, that we're waiting too long. <laughs> you get qualified while you're doing. It sounds like all three of you sort of set out on ventures before anybody sort of told you that, that was it was time to do that, which is, is fantastic. Um, we're gonna we're gonna work a little bit on the fly because I realize I don't like the order of my questions at the moment. So Serenity, get ready. I'm throwing you a curveball. I want to move to question number five instead of doing question number four because I think we need to do that question right now. So Serenity, can you give us question number five? Yes, I can. Okay. What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? There we go. <laughs> move that one up on the list. Um, do I have any of my panelists that want to start? trying to define what that means, especially remembering when we have some of our lower school students on. So we keep talking about being entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. So how can we help our lower school girls understand this word? Michelle, I can go ahead. start unless someone else is ready. Um, for me, um, and I just want to backtrack, <clears throat> excuse me, to the last question, just real quick. Um, I do not have a business degree, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and for me, what an entrepreneur means is kind of, you know, you're an inventor of sorts. You're figuring out, you're finding a problem and finding a solution and um, figuring out a way to solve that problem. Um, not just, I think everybody has thoughts in their heads about, <clears throat> oh, you know, I could have thought of that. You know, why didn't I do that? Or you see someone's business and you think, oh, it's so simple. I should have done that. But I think it's also not only finding that problem, but doing something about it, actually putting in the work, putting in the effort, making the sacrifices um, to actually see that problem through. We get another definition from Shana or Sianna. I'll go. So I think piggybacking off of that, it very much is a problem solver as well as an operator and executor. So it's someone that sees and I has a problem, wants to fix it, and then rolls up their sleeves to figure out how to fix it. And within that, that doesn't mean that they're successful the first time they try it. And I think that's one of the biggest characteristics of an entrepreneur is they fail, learn from that, and keep going. And I think it's hard to remember that sometimes when you see people be successful, but they kind of had road bumps along the way to get there. And it wasn't 
wasn't like they hit a home run the first time they went up to bat. So that's another big part of being an entrepreneur. Sienna, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think being an entrepreneur is through your thought and your action. So it's finding innovative ways to change even your daily life. It doesn't have to be like Tory Burch or Mark Zuckerberg. It really can just be like, oh, my toothbrush is annoying in this area. If I move it here, it cuts down time. It's more accessible. It really is daily life, just being innovative and problem solving, like they were saying. Fantastic. Thank you. Sonia, can you give our next question? We're at question four now. We back. <laughs> yep. So we know that everyone is especially good at some things and challenged by other things. What skills or traits do you think you possess that makes this job a good fit for you? Are there parts of your job that you find challenging and how do you meet those challenges? Sienna, how about we start with you this time? Okay. Well, there's a lot of, no, I'm just kidding. I was gonna say there's a lot of challenging things, but I think the traits I possess, um, I've always had my own vision. I bet my Stuart teachers who are still there can attest. I've always wanted to do things my way or just saw a way that I felt like I wanted to do it. And not that I struggled with going through other people's vision, but I just really like working for myself. And I think a lot of people do. And so I think my passion and my drive always for myself and what I want to do is always so much stronger than when I'm drudging through the mud trying to do someone else's. So I definitely think my personality really fits being an entrepreneur. And what was the second half of the question? Sorry, Sonia. <laughs> <It was laughs> no, no worries. Um, are there parts of your job you find challenging and how oh, do you meet those challenges? Um, yeah, and COVID, coronavirus has even upped those challenges to a level that I didn't know could be possible. But yeah, I definitely think also being by two countries, I'm in New Jersey right now in my actually my childhood bedroom, but I usually am in Liberia. And I had never planned on living in Liberia my whole life. And right before coronavirus started, I was really trying to figure out management and even open up a shop so I didn't have to like hire separate tailors to hire women. I had all these plans basically. And I was like, they are just about to start. And then COVID hit. And I making a relationship to trust someone while I'm over here takes time. And so all that went on halt. And so it's like, now where do I go? Also with coronavirus sales dropping, all these different things that you just, challenges that are unexpected. And when you work for someone, you can always look to them like, this is a problem, but you fix it. But when you're an entrepreneur, it's really all on me. Like I can't turn to someone and be like, you fix it. It's on me. So at the same time where I like doing my own vision and going my own way, because that's my personality. At the same time, when things go wrong, there's only me to blame. But it's the give and take, it's the balance. I still wouldn't have it any other way though. Thank you, Michelle, question to you. Yeah, I would totally agree with uh, Sienna that I'm the same way. I like to do things my way. Um, I think my whole staff is very used to that. I like things done a certain way and that's my personality. So it seems like it's probably an entrepreneur's personality. But just like she said, it's also, um, that means you have to be responsible for everything at the same time. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, you get to make the rules and there's no consequences. You have to stand behind the things that you say and have reasoning for it enough so that people believe in you and want to follow you and follow your vision as well. Um, so it's, there's a lot of responsibility that comes along with that. I'll say the other things that I think that I'm particularly good at um, that help me be an entrepreneur is I'm very detail oriented. Um, and especially for my business, which is you know a retail shop, there's so many different moving parts. There's, there's um, marketing from you know our little rewards cards to the wrapping paper we use for gifts to the bags to how I want my staff to greet people or help people. There's a lot of different moving parts. And um, so really being detail oriented really helps me. Um, and along with that multitasking, because as a small, I think particularly for a small business owner, um, you don't have that whole big staff that a large corporation would have to help you with things. So you are forced to do everything um, until you grow to a bigger staff, but that takes time. And, you know, not everybody wants to be a big corporation. Sometimes there's a lot of joy in small business ownership and being a part of the community, which is really what I enjoy um, about my job. Um, and as for the challenging part, I mentioned like being a part of the community. 
um, was something that I really desired when I opened the store. I wanted to be, you know, um, kind of part of that fabric in our neighborhood. And I feel like I have become that, but it's also challenging when you are a face that people recognize in your neighborhood, you are always kind of on display if you go out to eat, well, not now, but before you go out to eat dinner with your family and you see all of the kids that come into your store all the time, um, you know, there's never that time where you can like turn off and just be by yourself. You know, you're, you have to say hi to everybody, which is nice and stuff, but I'm a, um, more of a reserved person, I would say in general. So um, I'm not necessarily that outgoing. So that kind of thing can be hard for me sometimes. Um, and I think that's probably one of my biggest challenges that I face. Um, and I, others were talking about the networking. Um, I've never been particularly good at that, but that's something that um, in our business, I've had to um, work on that a lot. The relationships with our vendors and manufacturers is definitely very important and learning from other toy stores around the country um, as well has been really important. So networking is something that I've had to work on in those relationships and um, staying in touch with others, especially during coronavirus, as Siana mentioned, um, you know, sometimes we need a little extra help from our um, toy uh, industry partners and making use of those relationships has been very important um, in these trying times as well. Thank you. Shana, question to you. Perfect. So I think a lot of the same things of being a multitasker and detail oriented. I think the other thing is really being curious and willing to like learn things, see what people, other people are doing that you like and how can you replicate that? So I'm um, continually like subscribing to emails or looking at Facebook ads to be like, oh, why did I like this ad? And like, how can we apply that to us? Um, so I think that's like another big thing is and also to like asking questions amongst your company, like why do we do things this way or how could we do them better or more efficiently? So I think that's like another thing is being curious and then wanting to find answers and like better solutions for those answers is a big piece of it. Um, and then I think in terms of challenges, I think a big one is that technology is great and we're all so connected, but I also think it makes it really hard, especially when you're a growing business to turn off um, you know, you have customers coming in all the time. You want them all to be happy all the time. Um, and I think, too, balancing kind of where you are today as a business and where you want to grow. Because you always really want, always want your business to kind of be growing and being its best self. But you also have the responsibilities of the day-to-day, -day, your team, um, your tasks, things like that. So I would say those are the two. Thank you. Well, we're nearing the halfway point. So our last question is meant to send off our lower school students. Um, we will still be continuing for our middle and upper school students. Serenity, can you ask our last question of the series, please? Yes. So do you have any messages for the younger listeners that will prepare and inspire them to be leaders of business and entrepreneurship? So we have second, third, and fourth graders that are listening. What would you tell them before they head out about being a woman in business and entrepreneurship? Um, Shana, we'll start with you. Um, so I have two pieces. Um, the first is really work on being a good listener. Um, I think it's a really valuable trait. And so that way you hear people, you understand them. And when you speak up, you have things that kind of really respond to that in a way that's thoughtful and understanding. And the second is don't be afraid to ask questions. I think a lot of times when things are going on that you may not understand or you think that you're not privy to, the reaction is to not ask. Um, but there's really no harm in asking. And worse comes to worse, they might say, we'll talk about it later or this is not the right time. But I think building the muscles to start asking more questions is really important. Um, and something you can even do in the classroom now. Thanks, Michelle. <clears throat> um, I think those are really great points. Um, I would also say that, you know, for me in particular, I think there's can be a lot of pressure sometimes about what you should be doing when you grow up. And, you know, honestly, it took me a very long time. And I don't know if I've landed where my final destination is, to be honest. And I think um, it's okay to not know what you want to do. And sometimes life will lead you where you should be um, on its own. So, you know, I think it's also allow yourself to pay attention to what life throws your way and learn from every experience if it's a good one or a challenging one um, and let that kind of, you know, take it all in and digest it and really 
think about it. And maybe you do, maybe you do know that you want to be a doctor when you grow up, but maybe you don't. Um, and that's okay. You'll find your way and, um, you know, things happen as you grow up. So it's, I feel like sometimes there's a lot of pressure about trying to think about what you want to be. And um, I would say, take that pressure off yourself. It's always good to be thinking about what you should be when you grow up and you'll never stop doing that. And I think I'm still thinking about what I want to be when I grow up, but um, to just, you know, be focused, but also allow the universe to speak to you as well. Thank you, Sienna, your words. Yeah, so I would say uh, my mom actually showed me when I first started my company, some sketches I had made at art class at Stewart and I was drawing clothes. And like at that time, I had no idea what I was gonna be doing now. I don't even think I could think two years ahead. So you never know what you might be doing now or any passions or hobbies you like or what they might become. So if you have an idea or anything, a question or something you just think about, write it down because you never know what it might be for you in the future. Thank you, lower school teachers, thank you. And please thank your students for us and their attention. Um, if you feel that they have reached their attention span, please uh, feel free to log off. We're gonna move up to our questions a little bit more to middle school and upper school students from this point. Um, but we're gonna take a brain break first because I feel like we need a brain break. So let's get our other um, would you rather questions ready, students. And uh, who did I who did I start with last time? I'll start the other way. Sonia, give give us a would you rather question for our speakers. Would you rather have a flying carpet or a car that can drive underwater? So Aladdin or James Bond? Oh, that's a great one, Michelle. What do you think? <laughs> totally a flying carpet all the way. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to fly through the air. <laughs> Sienna. Okay, I'm gonna say the car because no one's seen what's at the bottom of like the deep parts of the ocean and I could be the first. So I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> Shayna. I think I'm gonna go with flying carpet. This is a hard one, but I do love traveling and I think the ability to get places faster is definitely appealing. And I'm a little afraid of sharks, so I don't necessarily need to come <laughs> in contact with them when we're uh, under the water. <laughs> yeah, sharks, sharks are no good. Well, I mean, all animals are good, but sharks are scary. <laughs> All right, Serenity, what's your would you rather? Okay, so if you had to choose a flower, who would you choose, a sunflower or a rose? Uh, Sienna. Um, I'll just say a rose. I think it's a classic, iconic flower. You can't go wrong with it. Michelle? I think I'll choose a sunflower. I just love their bright and feel like they always have like a happy face. <laughs> Shayna? I'm gonna also go with sunflower. They're actually one of my favorite flowers, but I just think they like bring, like you, ha you have to look at them and smile, like you can't not. So I would go with that. Great, Kelsey, what's your would you rather question? Okay, so my next would you rather is roller skating or ice skating? Ooh. Um, Shayna, go ahead. So I'm not very good at either, um, but I would have to go with ice skating. I think there's something really special, especially when you can be outside and do it. That's, you know, feels like Christmas or the holidays. And I really like that. Sienna? I'm gonna go with roller skating, like the music they play. Like in the movies, it just looks so cool. I look crazy, but the dances that they do and like the flips on like the wooden, I think it's just so cool. So I'd pick that. Michelle? Um, I'm also not good at either. <laughs> um, so putting that aside, I think I would also choose roller skating because I don't really like to be cold. Um, yeah. All right, so let's move on to some more complex thoughts. Um, I forget who I made green. Kelsey, I think it was you. Are you up for number seven? Yeah, okay. Um, can you explain in more detail what your greatest challenges and hurdles have been for you in the business in the world, like especially during COVID? Yeah, like the it's been it's been an interesting year or so. How has that impacted you? Um, Michelle, we'll go with you first. <clears throat> well, uh, in the spirit of entrepreneurship, I basically had to make an entirely new business um, with COVID because I own a retail store and we were shut down. For two months and um, 
you can't have a business when you don't have sales and that's pretty much you know that's out of business then um i said it to one of my staff members um actually this weekend i said i i feel like i'm always hustling and it gets a little exhausting um but that's also what you do um i never wanted to be online so i just want to say that first that was my whole purpose was to bring back like human connection come buy this thing in the store experience it i'm going to tell you why this is so important the whole nine yards i'm going to help you find what you want for a birthday gift we're going to wrap it you're going to leave here the recipient's going to be so ecstatic about this special thing you received and how beautiful it looks wrapped and the whole experience was what we pride ourselves on and what we're known for at the toy store and now that's gone because no one's coming into the store i mean now we are open with capacity limits um, which is a whole different thing um <clears throat> but i literally within a week had to create an online store and it's very tedious it's not fun i don't like to sell things online it took away the entire personal connection which is why i opened the store in the first place um so now I just feel like any other online real retailer. You know, I'm, here's a website, buy it, I'll send it to you, you can pick it up. Um, and it's not fun, but we have sales and it's the only thing, you know, for every retail business, uh, the holidays are important for a toy store. It's very important. It's most of our year is done in um, between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So if I didn't have the website, um, I probably would have been out of business right now, but it saved us because especially one of the other, I'm going all over the place here, but one of the other challenging things with COVID is that the regulations and restrictions keep changing and it affects retail businesses dramatically, especially, and I feel even worse for restaurants because it's been particularly hard on them. Um, so at one point it was, we were shut down and then it was, we could open, but it was very unclear how we could open and then it was a little bit more clear and then we could have five people in the store and then they said no it's not five people in the store it's five no not five customers in the store but it's five people and that includes my staff so then it was less people even and then that was during christmas time and then they said oh no we didn't mean that just five customers so we can let in more because so it's confusing for us to keep up with the guidelines because we want to make sure we're doing what's safe and um you know abiding by the law but it's also confusing for our customers. And then that, you know, makes us look like we don't know what we're doing. And I've always tried to, you know, we know what we're doing. We're a responsible store. And um, it, you just like, look like you don't know what you're doing. And sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. And I honestly just don't know how to keep up with these guidelines. So it's been extremely challenging. Um, and on top of that, we've, all of these confusing regulations have caused customers to be unhappy and you know sometimes unhappy customers leave unhappy reviews and it's honestly in my opinion all a direct result of the pandemic and sometimes i think people's frustrations with the pandemic are misguided um instead of being annoyed with the pandemic and leaving it at that they kind of you know latch on to a business here or there and um that's unfortunate and that's public and that doesn't go away so that kind of um all of that has been challenging so you know customer relations have suffered with covid um you know i had to make that online shop which while a, you know a lifesaver in terms of business was something that i never wanted to do i never wanted to be like you know that a word that we all dread um talking about amazon um <laughs> that's like a, a a negative word in retail um so you know, it's just been extremely challenging in so many ways. Um, and, you know, what I was saying about our in-store shopping experience, like we held a lot of events, you know, the avenue that I'm on, we had a lot of festivals and that was all a lot of fun. Like we would have book readings and signings and um, we did a lot of like drag queen story time and things like that for the community. And we love those times and it's a lot of fun and all of that's gone. And we tried to do it, you know, like this on zoom but it's just not the same and i miss seeing the kids in the store and you know them picking out gifts for their friends and just everything has changed and i'm looking forward to the day when this is over and we can resume regular business but um i had to how has 
this been challenging? I had to create a whole new business. And it's not one that I went into this uh, wanting at all. But we do what we have to do. And hopefully, we're there at the end of it. Thank you. It's a difficult story, I think, all business people are experiencing. Shana, how about you? I think for us, the most challenging thing has really been more on the inter like obviously external factors that we can't control. But one of the internal ones that I think I didn't account for originally was adjusting our team to working from home and not being able to kind of build culture and community amongst our own selves. Um, we were really fortunate that right now, before COVID, we were split in two offices, one in New York and one in North Carolina. So we were really comfortable with Google Meet and Slack. And so compared to a lot of other companies that are all in one place, we were prepared for that. But we kind of weren't prepared for the inability to grab a coffee with a coworker or when someone new comes in, get to take them for lunch and get to kind of really get to know them and not just in terms of what they're doing at work, but who they are as a person, what do they enjoy doing? How do they spend their weekend? And so I think for us, that's been a big challenge. And most of my team actually sits in North Carolina. So previously I'd go to fly down and see them and we'd spend time together. And I actually haven't been down to North Carolina since January of last year. Um, so within that, um, and also just communication styles, like how as a leadership team, do we talk to the team and let them know what's going on in the business? Cause they're no longer you know, sitting next to us every day and hearing what we're talking about. And so for us, we actually do like a monthly meeting with the entire company. Um, and we've had to bring some fun into that. So we play games. Um, so we've done a lot of things where we'll have people submit baby pictures or Halloween pictures, and we have to guess who's who. And that's kind of fun. We celebrate birthdays by sending virtual birthday cards. Um, for a while, we did a group fitness class. So every day at 11, we'd all stop what we were doing and for 15 minutes kind of do a home workout together. Um, so I think some of the challenges there are similar to what you guys face in school, where it's how do you foster like the fun parts of the day to day um, when the world is crazy and people need that more than ever. Um, and I think too, just kind of adjusting to customers' expectations, like Michelle said, you know, when items are delayed, it's not really our fault because we're not shipping them, but they're still our customers and we still want them happy. And you know, there's a lot of different expectations and, you know, people's patience, I think, is a little bit less than it was prior to this. So kind of managing that externally and then making sure our team's happy internally. Thank you. Rihanna. Oh, Sianna. <laughs> it's okay. I told her before my name is pronounced Sianna like Rihanna. That's why she called me Rihanna. And not <laughs> an insult either, like, honestly. But um, uh, I would say the biggest challenge is just March, my sales just plummeted. And I don't even blame anyone because like the last thing I was thinking about well, what clothes I was going to wear, I was wearing the same sweatshirt, the same sweatpants. Like it just was just so monotonous living the same day every day. And I think also besides the challenges of the business, I was going through a challenging time. Coronavirus just heightened all of the things that maybe you put on the back burner in life, whether it's relationships, where do I want my life to be, health, everything, just got such a microscope on it in my life that not only was my business not doing well, but I feel like I mentally was not doing well. Not being able to see people, me running out of Liberia to try to catch a flight, to be with my family, just everything just went haywire. And I think also when I wasn't right, like my business couldn't thrive either and the environment wasn't allowing my business to thrive. Sorry, drive. Um, but I also think I have to say now I would laugh at myself. My March self would laugh at my face for saying what I'm about to say. But I do think entrepreneurs really thrive in challenges. Like you just become so innovative. How can I fix this? And even if you do things you don't want to do, it might be the bet for the better of your business. And I actually, because my sales plummeted, started another business selling digital downloads because my main issue is my operations and me not being able to be in Liberia. So I was like, I need to start a business where I don't even need to be having tangible items. So I'm just like, this is how I'm going to fix this. And now I have two. So would that have happened without coronavirus? Definitely not. Um, am I still upset with coronavirus? Yes. But I just think challenges, you can really thrive through them. And these challenges don't stop. Like coronavirus, like she said, regulations up and down. The cases are not going down. I don't see where this ends. I hope it ends. I think it will end. But it's interesting. Like, I thought in March I'd be back in Liberia in August. In August, I was like, oh, I'll be back in January. It is January now. And I'm like, I'm stopping with the timelines. You just got to take each day as it comes and work with it how it comes. And 
I have a feeling everything will turn out all right because I've survived this far. Thank you. All of your positivity through this is uh, a testament to just resilience, right? What it takes in, in difficult times to, to keep innovating. Thank you for sharing about that. Um, Sonia, what's our next question? How has your experience as an entrepreneur been influenced by your identity as a woman and also by your identity in other ways? Mm, Michelle, can you start us off? Sure. Um, you know, it's 2021 and I hate that I have to say it, but it's harder being a woman. Um, and, you know, it sounds a little silly when I tell the story now, but um, when I was looking for a spot for my store, I visited a lot of uh, locations, met with a lot of landlords. Um, and I was still a stay-at-home mom at this point, and I had a six-month-old. So um, my older daughter was three. I had my second daughter. Um, I went to this. She's looking at me right now. Uh, <laughs> I went to this one um, store, and I had my younger daughter in the stroller. And literally, when I walked up, the gentleman laughed at me. Um, he tried to hide it, but I saw him laughing. And... What else could I do? I didn't have childcare. I was, I had my business like ready to go. All I needed was my store. So, you know, I'm, it was a last minute thing. You know, that's what I had to do. Um, I ignored that he did that and I just kept going. You know, it kind of hurts your pride a little bit every time you encounter those experiences. But um, I would be lying if I said that they don't happen quite often. Um, and, you know, of course, like I hate that. You have to say that, but you're definitely going to have to work harder as a woman. Um, and you can be angry about it or you can just keep moving through it. And of course, like there's a little part of me that's angry about it, but um, you can't let it eat you up. You just have to keep moving. Um, and if you're a minority, you're going to have to work harder as well. But that's just the world we live in. And you know, I choose to just move past it or, you know, be a bigger person than other people and know that I'm doing what is right for me and what, um, you know, I'm confident in my abilities and that I can do it. And, you know, just don't let people say that you can't. I mean, they will say that you can't. You'll get told that you can't or that your idea is silly on all the time. But um, others don't know what you're capable of. You know what you're capable of. And you, <clears throat> I think what everybody has to realize for themselves is if you're passionate about it, you're willing to do the work, which there's a lot of work, it's constant work. If you're willing to do all of that, <clears throat> no one, um, no one should, you know, what all these things that other people say, they're meaningless. Um, you have to be confident in yourself, know that you can do it, know that you're going to work hard and um, you might have to work harder than other people, but you can do it um, as long as you're committed. Thank you. Sienna? Yeah, I would say being uh, African-American and being a woman is a double whammy. Um, I think, too, why I was so wanted to be an entrepreneur, I just wasn't ready to have a cis white male tell me what to do. And I kept that open, like I might have to go into the corporate world. I've gotten my college degree. Like that might have to be my path. But let me see if this works out before I have to hear someone tell me what to do. Um, but I have to say at the same time, what I notice now is like when I'm looking for grants or resources or even trying to network with people, I wonder if I was a male or if I was white, would it be easier? But just me and my personality, I don't like to dwell on what I don't have. I just like to use the talents that I was God gave me and work through that. So I like to try to bust doors down, but just go full force through the doors that I do have open for me. And I do think one thing too is like as a woman, and as um, being black, there are certain doors that are open for me that you just have to grasp. And I think one thing that I did not realize growing up is that networking is so important. And like, I don't know if I don't like networking because I'm pretty outgoing, but I'm just like, oh, I don't need to get a card. I don't need to get their number. Like, I'll figure it out. But like establishing relationships with not only your classmates, but if you go somewhere, I know it's so awkward, but like just try to tell them your name, tell them what you want to do because you never know what they might be or where you might need them from. Um, but I just think, yeah, use your talents for what you can. And I think 
Um, I don't really dwell on what I can't do because of my gender or my race, but that doesn't mean it's not there. And I think although this is the way the world works, you can still flourish in it perfectly well and fine. And if you ever have hurdles, there's people who look like you, um, who your race and your gender who definitely have been through it. And if you ever want to be like, well, today at school, today at work, they said this to me, can you believe it? And they're going to be like, yeah, I can believe it. It happened to me. So there's always someone you can reach out to and always someone who can share your experience. You can work through it. But yeah, it's challenging, but it's also, I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you. Shana? Um, kind of piggybacking on that, I think a lot of it has to do with the confidence and like believing in yourself. And so I think if you believe you should have a seat at the table or in a conversation or making a decision, they'll believe you too. And I think, especially for me, I'm like the youngest member on my team, my most of my career, I've been the youngest person in the room. And so that has been a challenge in itself and that, you know, people come in and they're kind of like, oh, like when I was your age and I was like, no, 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 we're having the same conversation. And like, I deserve a seat here just as much as the person next to me. And so I think with that, like having the confidence in yourself, even if you don't actually have that confidence, just to kind of like show off that confidence. And so I don't want to say like truly fake it till you make it because you don't want to not be yourself. But at the same point, like for me, like I can come across a lot more confident in a meeting than, than maybe I'll walk away from it and say like, oh, wow, like I'm proud of myself. I actually did that. Um, so I think that's a big piece of it that if you, if you want people to take you seriously, like you have to believe in yourself first. Cause if you show doubts and uncertainties in those moments, people kind of feed off of them where if you can elude confidence, even if it's just for that time being, it really kind of helps to set the stage. Um, and then I think similarly, just having really strong women leaders in your life that you can look back to and talk to through these things. And so when moments frustrate you, or you want to understand how to navigate something, maybe in that moment, kind of taking it with stride, but being comfortable with being vulnerable kind of after the fact and figuring out what the best next steps are for you um, is a big piece. And that for me has been really valuable. And my first bosses are the people that I still go to all the time for help and suggestions and feedback. And I think it's mentorship is like a really big piece of it. Thank you. Um, Sonia, I think we're gonna skip to 10 because we're almost at a time and I wanna make sure we get to that one. Can you take 10 for us, Sonia? Yeah, of course. Our upper school girls are starting to think about their professional paths. What advice would you like to give them as they make plans and choices at this time? I know that's a hard one. I can, as an educator, you're always looking at these, in, these enthusiastic, intelligent, aspiring women and want to say the thing that's going to set them on the exact right path. And we, we know that that's not in words can't do that, but if you can think of any, what would you like to share? Yeah, I can start. I would say, first of all, you think you know what you want to do and where you're going to go, but you really don't. And I know that's not maybe comforting, but you might have all these plans. Like I got to get into this college. I got to do this. I got to do that. Our life will be over. Life will not be over. So like, if you try your best and the best, all your best, that's really all you can do. So you can't worry about what's on the other door. And like I said, mentioned, I only apply to schools with hospitality. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I have to do this. And then my path diverged. And I think the pressure to like, almost be an adult. I actually, when my, cause my brother's four years younger than me. The fact that I got up at like seven every day, then got out of practice at 5.30 below and then did homework after blows my mind. You are literally a superwoman. Like you don't even know. So you have all the skills you have to do whatever you want to do. And if you wake up one day and like, I want to be a doctor, then the next day you want to be marine biologist, you probably could do that. So don't feel pressure to like, know what you want to be, have everything worked out because it's 17, 16, 18, even at 25, like you never know how things might go and you have all the equipment to just switch paths. Thanks. Shana? Um, I would say everything happens for a reason. I'm I've learned that kind of the hard way and you kind of have to trust that even if things in the moment don't feel that way, there is a reason why it does happen and it leads you somewhere else or some other adventure. Um, and the other thing too is like, even now things that you guys can start thinking about is like, what is your personal brand and like what interests you and how do you want, like use yourself as like your own calling card. And I think for me, that's something that I didn't do early enough and I wish I had. Um, and even things like, it sounds silly, but I created a Twitter account when I was in college, never used it. And now I use Twitter more than any other social media. And it's how I've met a lot of great people to network with. I interact with our users. And so I think 
starting to do things like that where you can try out different mediums and figure out like how to show who you are as a whole person um, really comes a long way. And right now, like people do care about like who they're hiring as a whole, not just where you went to college or maybe where you were previously. So just remember that there is a level of humanity that's important that I think is easy to lose sight of when you're focused on test scores and GPAs and things like that. But nobody sits here and asks me like where I went to college or how I did in Mrs. Driscoll's AP history class or something like that. So just remember that. Michelle? Yeah, I think they, uh, Sianna and uh, Shana um, brought up some really great points. Um, and I just wanna reiterate that it's okay if you don't know what you wanna do um, as your career. And maybe you'll have several careers like me um, in your lifetime. And I think all of that is okay. And all of that um, leads you on your path. And um, I would say don't get bogged down by the pressure to choose you know, your life's path right now because you're going to change as a person too and you're going to meet other people who will bring you new information that you didn't even realize and maybe that sets you on another path and to not get overwhelmed by what your friend's goals are either because you're not your friend you're yourself um, and I think I didn't really learn that until I got to college and was around um, a more diverse group of people that you know there's a lot of different wants and desires. You don't have to be a doctor, but if you want to be a doctor, that's also great. Um, sometimes, you know, you can get bogged down by what, you know, everyone else has it figured out, but, you know, I bet they don't too. So it's okay to take your time and figure it out. And what I majored in in college has no bearing on what I do today. Yes, I learned things along the way. Um, and just like the other women said, um, no one asked me where I went to school. When it comes time for that job interview, what matters most is how you present yourself in that job interview and how um, willing you are to work and do good work. And that always speaks for more. I've hired many people um, and it might seem easy to work in a retail job, but it's actually trickier, I think, than people realize, especially at a small business. And people with you know, a great education um, sometimes do great, sometimes don't, sometimes people that don't have any education, do wonderful. It's really about how much work you put in, in the end, um, no matter what what else you have going on, you really have to do the work and that really speaks volumes. Um, so yeah, I would say let life lead you and that's okay. Well, thank you so much to all three of our panelists. Thank you to our three moderators. Special shout out to Serenity, who is the youngest person who hung in with us for this entire time. Um, and, and fifth grade in general, who is our, our, uh, our, our youngest that hung out on the entire call. Um, we learned so much from all three of you. We're grateful for your time that you would come back and mentor these women. Um, to our moderators, thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit about moderating a panel and for being awesome steward students. Uh, thank you, teachers and uh, administrators, for giving us the time to take to do this, and we'll let you get on with the rest of your day. So thank you. And it was uh, wonderful to have all three of you speakers, uh, Shana, Michelle, and uh, Sianna. Thank you so much. <laughs>